Hi, my name is Alana, and this is Jen. And we'd like to thank you for coming to our presentation, which is enhancing middle schoolers' self determination through interprofessional collaboration. Um, to start off, we're kind of curious what professions are in the room right now. Are there teachers? Can you raise your hand if you're a teacher? Okay. Um, admin, school admin, um, PT, <laughs> Rachel. Um, OT. What are you? OT, okay. <laughs> um, and then what is your profession? Did you raise your hand for teacher? No. Oh, okay. Okay. I saw you. Okay. Like, how do you say that? <laughs> but it's good to ask, right? Mm -hmm. sure. Online, we have an SLP. Okay, SLP. Anybody else from online? Okay. All right. So we have a little bit of a mix. Um, Jen and I are both occupational therapists. And our second question for you all is, what do you think occupational therapists do in school-based OT? Should we write down? Well, we have our, oh, well, if we have a big group, but you could actually share so that people from our online um, viewers can also or do you want to? Do you prefer to write down stuff that you associate OTs with? That would be probably a good thing, so that we know. <laughs> like, what do school school based occupational therapists do? I mean, they could write here. They could write on the desk. They could share it out. Online, somebody that support sensory regulation. Support sensory regulation. Oh, we could write it down. We're, we're curious about how, you know, other specialists or school-based professionals perceive what we do or what we have to offer. Um, you could also add expectations. Like, like if I have, we, we have a school-based OT, like what am I expecting the OT to do with my students and with me? Mm-hmm. So fine motor skills, you want to write that over there or here. You want to do it here, Alana, so that they could see on the camera. So fine motor skills, we said, and then gross motor skills. Okay. Melissa, are you doing your job description? <laughs> Melissa is an OT from the county, so she's actually cheating, but... <laughs> Supporting of um, um, how to adapt and accommodate different activities so our kids can be included. Um, so earlier it was sensory, right? The sensory processing and now adapting for inclusion. No. Like for example, like garden. Mm -hmm. So we want to maybe we use raised garden beds to accommodate our kids mm -hmm. that are wheelchairs, or we might adapt uh, how we're watering it with the different kinds of different squares. Um, so adapting a common anything else from the uh, chat? Uh, gross motor uh, skills is like writing, typing. Okay, writing and typing. Okay. Well, I don't yeah, this is just like a random thought. So that was our first question. What do school-based OTs do? Like what you think we do? My second question is, what do school-based OTs do in middle schools? Oh, I like that answer. I don't know. Kids, it was we were definitely doing all of the things that are already listed, mm -hmm. but we would also work on if we're working with the more severe kids, we're kind of looking at life skills mm -hmm. things too. Can they life can skills. They follow the directions to cook? Can mm -hmm. they use tools for cooking? And or we also kind of looked at um, the vocational skills, sorting. Mm -hmm. I forgot, we have a our uh, online. Meeting. 
Okay, so I said <laughs> we can work on life skills such as cooking activities um, or pre-vocational skills such as simple assembly activities. So we're just kind of expanding to other areas beyond just fine motor, gross motor. Thank you, Melissa. So actually, that was a, a good you know, summary of what, or this is a good summary of what school-based OTs do or what we're expected to help with in the classroom. Although, in addition to everything that's on here, we have a different set of things that we are addressing or we addressed in a middle school, at a middle school in San Jose. So it's a Sierra Mont Middle School. I don't know if anybody's familiar with that school. So uh, we will move on to the actual presentation. It was just good for us to know like the perceptions and the expectations because that actually frames our practice. So we're gonna move on to the formal part and then the informal part after. Okay, to introduce ourselves a little bit more, um, Jen is an experienced occupational th therapist working here at Santa Clara County Co Office of Education. Her caseload consists of middle school through post-secondary students in moderate to severe programs. Um, I'm in the middle of my second year as an occupational therapist. I work with high schoolers um, and adult transition students in mild to moderate programs. This project started when I was an intern under Jen. Um, and before I started with Jen, she had already started working with the speech therapist and the adaptive PE teacher to create an event called Fun Fridays for kids with orthopedic impairments. Um, that teacher was really receptive to having multiple service providers in the room. And they would take turns having a fun event where one of the specialists would lead it and the others would kind of help the kids out. So during my internship, um, I completed a project on the benefits of interprofessional collaboration and how to increase the collaboration among the specialists and teachers in the classroom. And uh, Jen and this other spe specialists were more than receptive to it and wanted to try it out. So we turned Fun Fridays into more of co a collaborative event where we would um, take a chunk of the day. It would start with a lesson from the teacher and then it would go into the speech therapist prepping the activity and the steps the OT conducting some of the activities, the APE teacher conducting some of the activities. And it was a fully collaborative model with everyone involved and the students involved in what, as well. Um, we started getting feedback from the IAs and the teachers or the paraeducators that were like, oh, wow, these students are really participating more. Uh, the student that used to sit at the back of the classroom is now volunteering to show their work. They're talking to each other. They're all included in the activities. No one's sitting out not wanting to participate. Um, so then Jen and I were like, let's look into this and let's look at what's really going on with these kids and how they're improving on some of these self-determination skills. Um, so if you all could scan this barcode, I want us to get into the mindset of a middle schooler. So if you can think back to when you were in middle school, um, I'd love to hear a few words about what your middle school experience was like. I would agree with all of these words so far. We have insecure, awkward, uh, social development. I'll give us a couple more minutes. Painful, insecure, isolated, mean. Unique, unsettling. 
stressful, problematic, emotional. This is going to go well into the next part because there's a couple of reasons maybe why we're feeling this way. Competitive. Challenging. Okay. Okay. So, um, yeah, there's kind of a reason why we may have felt that way in middle school. Um, in middle school, there's a lot of expectations. We're expected to be more independent in functional and critical skills. Um, students are now kind of expected to be able to advocate for their own needs at school. Um, in addition to all of these expectations, the middle school brain is still developing. Right now, at the middle school age, they're wired to be flexible and their mindset is really on the present. They're not at all thinking about the long-term future or long-term consequences. At the middle school age, executive functioning skills are just beginning to develop due to a peak amount of gray matter in the brain. They're also starting to um, go into two different developmental stages, which is adolescent egocentricism, which is the reason they become very concerned about how others perceive them. Um, they also are really focused on, number one, being unique, but also fitting in. Um, they have a hard time believing that anyone else has experienced their experiences. Um, so it's kind of an internal battle of I want to be me, but I also want to fit in too. I found this funny video. Um, it's a TikTok, which goes well with middle schoolers middle school. in 2023. Executive functioning skills. <laughs> yeah. What? I didn't. I didn't do it. <laughs> no running at all. I don't know if any of the teachers relate to that. I I see that at my high school too. Okay, so um, now we could go into occupational therapy in middle schools. So one of the reasons we asked about how you guys perceive occupational therapists in middle school is because research just doesn't really seem to exist at that age group about what occupational therapists should be doing in the middle school. Um, so a survey of occupational therapists said um, middle schoolers tend to come in with IEP goals related to handwriting, fine motor skills, and executive functioning skills. But when occupational therapists thought about what they really wanted to be working on with these students and what they found the need would be, they were thinking of skills such as executive functioning, assistive technology, and life skills as some of the most important areas to target. Um, for people that are not OTs, we think of skills as um, something that can be remediated, almost fixed, developed upon, or com compens <laughs> compensatory, I can't say it, compensatory strategies, um, which are finding an alternative way to be able to participate in something. 
So it would be the difference between practicing handwriting over and over and over versus incorporating maybe some assistive technology and learning to type, which would be easier for the student. Um, by the middle school and high school level, we find that with remedial approaches, we don't always see as big of a change, but compensatory um, approaches can make a much bigger difference for the students and also be more motivating for the students as well. Extensive support needs. Um, back when we made this presentation, it was a newer term, um, but to go over what that means, um, it's a classification that includes severe limitations in intellectual functioning and adaptive behavior. It can include motor disorders, sensory deficits, severe communication problems, and other physical or mental health conditions. Um, and then some of these behaviors can present as severely challenging in the classroom that significantly limit their functioning and cause the student to require extensive support. So these are some of the students that we worked with in this project. Contextually based intervention services. Um, at least within occupational therapy, we're always thinking a lot about context. Um, so when we design a treatment with a student, we're really thinking about a lot of different factors. We have an entire, uh, <laughs> we have a lot of different factors that we look at and we wanna make sure our services are contextually relevant to the student. It guides everything we want to do with the student. It guides whether we push into a classroom, whether we pull them out, whether we see them with peers, whether we see them individually, um, whether they need help at recess because that's a motivating thing for them to be able to participate in or whether we help them with schoolwork because they're more motivated to do schoolwork. So to provide contextually based services um, when thinking of all these factors for the students requires planning and intentionality to work collaboratively with the teachers and other team members. So even if we think, oh, it'd be great to push in with the student at this time because this would cause them to make the most progress, that might not work for the teacher, that might be distracting for other peers. There's so many different other factors we also have to plan around. Um, and then self-determination. So if you all could scan this barcode and tell us what you think of when you hear the word self-determination. Uh, oh. The sound. Oh, wait, can you try again? I think I had to do that. Is it good? Oh. Great. So um, I'm assuming positive connotation, self-advocate, making choices, students are motivated, they're willing, it's student-centered, it's, um, it's empowering, it's internal motivation, responsibility and autonomy. capable. Yeah, these are all great words. Becoming a self-advocate. I like that one.
Okay, so um, for uh, curriculum development in general in special education, um, teaching self-determination skills is best practice. I don't know if a lot of other service providers, teachers know that occupational therapists can focus on self-determination skills as well. Um, However, in the school system, tracking self-determination skills can be kind of difficult. Um, occupational therapists, at least, we use standardized assessments to track, and there's no classroom-based measure of self-determination skills. Um, and there was a study that showed that incorporating benchmarks at set intervals during the school year could highlight increases in self-determination skills throughout the year but it's still not a standardized assessment that's easy to measure. Okay, so interprofessional collaboration. I'm assuming many of you have to do that on a daily basis, but that's the alliance between different professionals working together to share goals and increase the individual's outcomes. Interprofessional collaboration is also mandated by the IDEA, and it's part of providing education in the least restrictive environment. Um, so some of the benefits of interprofessional collaboration is that it can enhance skills and prepare students for inclusion. It can benefit staff as they're kind of seeing what other people do, realizing how we can work together. Um, and it can help other staff members see the benefit of what we're doing with the students and have help with carryover in the classroom as well. Okay, so now um, we're gonna go over our actual project and what we did with our students at Sierra Mott. It wasn't working? Nope. Okay. So um, I know Alana already had mentioned earlier, like how we started with it. Like it was more of a, well, historically at Sierra Mont, we, there were like two classrooms who um, served students with OI. And then it became like just one classroom with the same number of students that were supposed to go into classrooms. So we had to find a way to actually help with managing the class but also addressing the goal so that was the first you know the first purpose of what why we're having fun Fridays second purpose was for us to actually encourage the classroom staff to work with the students more you know given that there's like a a big number of students that they were that they were serving at that time so and we were thinking that uh, let's make Fridays fun, right? Like let's make Fridays like something that the students are looking forward to. Let's make Fridays something that the staff is looking forward to. So it became like a party of sorts, like in our in our classroom. So every time we come in, there's this particular student who would say, "Oh, there's OT. It's party time." And then the mom came like to pick her up early, and I said. Parvati, please do not say that because they might think that they were not doing anything, you know, that, that addresses their goals. But she's like, no, it's party time because we we would do a lot of the fun Friday activities so or facilitate it as OTs. So we called them um, like culminating events. So we picked one Friday every month. It's usually the last Friday. And then we would have um, a specific theme. Like when Alana started, it was around fall, right? So she started it with the Thanksgiving um, event. So I'm just going to show you um, how or what it looked like when we started. So, you know, bare minimum, like this was our, our set of slides. Um, we made sure that there's a specific objective that we're trying to address, not just like having fun all the time. <laughs> so um, there's a schedule and we usually ask a teacher to kind of like, um, you know, look at the schedule or give us a schedule that would work for your class because we didn't want the staff to actually feel burdened about it. And that's something that we keep 
in our minds, like when we're doing the interprofessional activities, just because we want to make sure that our parent educators and the rest of the classroom staff are going to help us implement what we're doing. So it has to be something that's, you know, like they feel good about it. They feel comfortable doing, doing so. We make sure that the teacher also is like, okay, I'm, I'm, you know, I'll go for it. Like I'll put the schedule up on the slides so that you know, like where you're coming in. So it used to be like this, like, you know, SOP does her own thing or his own thing and then OT and then APE does. So it actually has evolved. So this year, this is our second year running and Alana's obviously not with us anymore. She's uh, with, uh, I guess. Yeah, it is an SDC, but we have uh, mainstreaming happening or inclusion for a couple of students who are identified as being, you know, appropriate to go to the gen ed classrooms. But it's not the whole class that goes. Um, I think for PE, it's the whole class that goes to PE, but like for math and science, because um, we are serving students who have more disabilities or impairments. Um, but the goal is for them to actually be part of the, you know, a more inclusive environment. So that's why we started this, because we were seeing that, okay, OTs do handwriting, OTs do typing, APE does, you know, things that would make them go to the gen general at PE, right? Um, SLP does communication, but then we were not, we were not seeing the, like, the performance that would, you know, would actually push them to be more successful in an inclusive environment because we're just addressing isolated skills. But then a student, I, I know you know this, like a student may perform well, let's say with APE because they love movement or a student may like to be with OT because, oh, arts and crafts, handwriting, typing, like I like those things, but I don't like movement. So it, it was becoming like more of a, I don't know, remediating, right? It's not like we're really helping them thrive and then gain the skills that would actually make them work within a you know a least restrictive uh, environment or a less restrictive environment um and i know why you're asking about that cuz i know there are challenges to this because uh you know like even in middle school the schedules like vary like there are three different schedules that we actually had to consider when we were doing this like so we had to ask the teacher when exactly can we have this type of uh, group activity wherein we are there, we're actually seeing the performance of each student on varying activities so that when we actually document their performance and their results of how they're doing, it's more of a collaborative effort rather than OT only looking at fine motor and APE just looking at gross motor and you know speech just looking at communication. So the teacher said, Okay, I already have fun Fridays happening, so you go to, you know, make sure that your schedule would accommodate Fridays as, uh, you know, that group activity. So that was, this is our first set of slides. And now, like, we're still evolving, like, depending on um, the staff. We don't have, like, a steady set of classroom staff like OTs change you know like we get pulled out moved to a different site even SLPs have that same issue so it, it it's almost as if we have to require the person to be like, are you willing to collaborate are you willing to work you know in this kind of uh, you know environment or this setting so we it's intentional it's deliberate and I'm thinking from day one of the inclusion collaborative, we always hear that we're intentional. Everything that we have to think about now, like it has to be intentional. We, we are not just like um, expecting things to be automatic. So for us to achieve change, like something has to be intentional. So even with the parent educators, like we we are we were making sure that um, okay, we look at the slides, we look at how we're going to be able to help our students, and right there and then we say, if you do not get what we're trying to have our students do, please ask the question, and we're all going to problem solve. It's not like we're not going to say anything because we don't want to make mistakes. We're making it into a natural environment for us for all of us to learn and that's making our students um get motivated to actually say i don't know what to do i need help because even because the adults are modeling so we are making that as part of a like uh, well an unspoken rule because we don't really say like you have to ask questions you have to like when we do not know what to do it's okay to ask questions when you need help it's okay to call on the adult that's right next to you 
raise your hand. So we we have that we facilitate that natural context, kind of like in a general ed classroom. Like you're you're not gonna just stay still, right? Like we also encourage our students to to speak up, to say when they need help. Because middle schoolers won't. I have a middle schooler. And every time I ask her, like, I see her struggling. Like, I can see her face like, when she's doing homework at night. Like, do you need help? No, I got this. No, I'm good. Like, that's the, those are the standard answers. And I know for a fact that it's not because she's, it's already 10 o'clock and so she's still doing homework. So it's the same thing with my students. Unless I ask or unless we say, oh, you have your AAC device. Do you want to say something? And then they say something. So we're we're facilitating that natural interaction so that they could take the same skills, bring them to the bring the same same set of skills to the inclusive environment. Because some of them do, like two or three of a uh, class of eleven, they go out, they go to the gen ed um, classes, and they mingle with um, their same age peers. So we encouraged um, that. So these are the things that have changed, like, you know, pre and post, like now we have more, um, you know, like, oops, I'm not going to play the candy corn. So I'm just showing you like an example of what we're doing um, or what we have been doing since 2021. Um, so the schedule and you see that Christmas tree over there. I don't know if you can see. Um, it's like made of garland. Well, this I'm saying something about this because I don't know if you can see. the The top part is green. The bottom part is red. Um, so the Dollar Tree ran out of green garland, and then we had to ask our students. Well, sort of termination, right? Right? Like choice. So we said, okay, we are gonna go to the Dollar Tree later and. But we have a problem. There's no more, you know, we don't have any more green garland. So what are we going to use for our trees? So we, you know, we gave them choices. Like the only ones that are available are gold, blue, silver, and red. They picked red. So you will see that the projects that they made or they're making, it's about themselves. So um, we are not about like how perfect, you know, in our standards, like how how a, an art activity should look, right? It's not, we're not measuring that performance on, on the, based on the end product. It's more of like the process, because unless we have that process going on in the classroom, they're not going to thrive in a gen ed classroom if we're all, all we're after is like how are you how are you sticking this part to this part or you know how how are you copying the actual model so we're all about the process so you see the the staff like very involved this was a costume making contest so it's kind of like a maker you know when you what you do in a maker space so we give them a set of stuff that we had you know um gift wrappers, cardboard, and then they had like li little groups. I, I don't know, I don't remember how many groups we have. Maybe we had three or four. And then we also made sure that a, a, an adult or two would be part of the group. And they thought about the costumes. So what what are we gonna use? Like, you know, which which material would work for this costume? So they actually figured it out. Like one was, I think, gingerbread yeah and then there's a uh, candy cane i don't know because this one cannot be seen like yeah one of the students said i'm going to be the candy cane so we, we're giving them those opportunities to actually pay uh, i mean use use their choice making right like a lot of choice making so the speech therapist is actually doing a lot of work when we have this uh, fun fridays so we you know we do a lot of bingo so most of these students are already like in high school um so so more themed activities i think we were well this is going to be the the student who will be we will be talking about more in detail later so they are preparing food like um i think we included this picture because a lot of our students are using assistive technology so we have to make sure that when we set up that environment uh, for our fr fun fridays that everything is there whatever they need to actually participate, they're already there in, in front of them, available for them to use so that we don't have to always prompt because in a in an environment that's not special day, right? A lot of the interactions, you know, we, we would not be like, 
you. She just said, hi, you say hi. And that's what we do in special day classes from now because they're still learning about communication. But outside, right, when they're at PE in the cafeteria, you don't really like always have to prompt the students. So we're having them do the same skills that we are expecting this their same age peers do outside. So I know for us it's deliberate and intentional, but later on you will find out like that deliberate and intentional planning, what would happen to one of our students. So you see the smile. So everything that we do, like for our students who do not have um, or have limited ability to write, we use assistive technology. There are apps for that. Um, so we have our worksheets scanned. They type the their answers. Or if they cannot uh, spell, like we have those, I mean, you know, there's word prediction. So everything is set up for them to participate. So we're aiming for successful participation rather than just looking at like, how much of the skill am I addressing? Because once they've already learned how to participate, right, everything else follows. They'd be more willing to do those drills if you want to drill them on how to write their names. Go ahead. But if they are willing to participate, and that's what we're after, because this is in a group. So when they're willing to participate, that's when we are able to target individual skills. So you see his smile. He doesn't actually like to be, uh, I still have him in high school. He doesn't want his pictures taken. But when I say, when I have, when I say oh, I'm going to make slides and people are going to see your face, you know, like for, for instructions for the rest of the classes that I have, you're going to be the, the model. And he said, yeah, I'll do it. So... So I think, well, this part, an occupational profile, I know OTs have certain terminologies that would refer to like looking at a person holistically. So we have this specific form that we use to find out about, you know, the or how the physical environment is affecting our students, um, their social roles and expectations, their background, cultural, personal, temporal, virtual, and their priorities. So the thing about working in um, special day classes who have more impairments, more disabilities, is that a lot of them have communication difficulties. So a form like this, we have to collaborate with other school-based professionals and the paraeducators, you know, working with them and the teachers. They're not usually able to answer everything or even the parents. Like if we are doing like a formal evaluation or assessment, we have to have the parents give us this input. Um, most of the time we do this on a time crunch, we actually don't. And that's the truth. So um, now we're being more cognizant that for us to actually have our students improve in the skills that we're expecting for them to improve, we have to know everything about them, at least in this aspect. So, which brings me a good segue to the student who I, I was referring to. So her name is Amy. So she, she initially had like individual direct services, you know, from, from middle, I mean, from elementary school. And her goal was for her to type. So I said, oh, that's easy enough, right? Like give her a typing app or a computer with an adapted keyboard. And we're probably going to get the goal done in a, in a school year. The only, the only problem was her participation levels was really like down. So she would not talk. Right. And she would only talk to the pair educator who spoke Spanish. And that's even not about the task that we were supposed to give her. Right. So uh, during that year, I think it was her second year. The first year was during the pandemic. So we saw her online. She's tech savvy, but we only saw the ceiling and she wouldn't talk. So, I mean, that's I mean, she's smart, actually. She knows that, well, they're not I'm, they're going to see my name but they're only going to see the ceiling. And then if we like holler, like, Amy, are you there? Yeah, she was, you know, yeah. So she would do that. So this is her um, occupational profile. So she used to walk her, she's in an OI class, but she's ambulatory. She would go around the campus um, using the walker by herself. Um, yeah, she's usually quiet. She would only speak to um, the Spanish speaking staff. Um, and then she is from a Mexican family, and then her family is also just Spanish-speaking. That's what she told me after 
she knew that I could talk to her in Spanish. And then she said they have a bakery. So, oh, she ha they have a bakery and then she loves doing creative projects. So being that she was almost the age of my kid, I actually had stuff at home and I brought them, you know, like those, uh, they were paper dolls in our time, but now they could design them and they have like their templates already ready, right? I would still call them paper dolls, but, but she could actually design on the templates, right? So that's what I brought first. And then that started the conversation. So she started talking to me. Um, so we had, yeah, her level of motivation. She, she was one of the students who went to the classes for inclusion, but she, what her motivation was really low. And we would see her, Alan and I, like watch her and going to pee and she would just stand there while the rest of the, you know, the class were doing their laps. So she would just st stand and then eventually sit and then say nothing. So I know I'm not, I wasn't supposed to pull her out, but then she wasn't doing anything and you, you'd see her face, right? So I would ask her, okay, Amy, are you, um, are you staying here and joining later? Or do you want to come back, you know, with me to the classroom so that we could work in OT? So that was when she was having individual OT. So I gave her the fashion, you know, the template. And then, oh, I, I actually had her working on the stuff that the teacher gave, right? And I found out that she actually uses Google Translate. She uses a lot of the tech stuff. So typing was not even supposed to be a goal because she was already proficient in using tech. Um, and then she was doing Google Translate on her own. Like she has a phone. So she was doing everything already that we thought she wasn't doing just because she wasn't talking, right? Um, and then she could even shop on Amazon. Um, she loves texting. So she would text a teacher and the paraeducator when she wants to answer. So typing was like scrapped, right? Like, I don't think typing is our problem here or the skill that, you know, that we should be addressing. So, so this is her. So she, um, if she was doing individual OT with me. And then I said, oh, Amy, I think you're very capable of here sharing your skills, you know, with your friends. I said, um, we're going to make a slide deck for the group activity. Do you want to show them how it's done? So from that time on, every single time that we would have a group activity, she was the model. So she would do the activity first, right? And then she's proud of herself. Like, you know, I said, look at what Amy did. And they knew, and they knew her because she's her, their classmate, right? So they would look at the visuals every single step until she finished the activity. So it evolved into having her be on the pictures to her being in the front of the room. And she would speak in English in front of her friends. So, you know, like, ooh, right? Like she didn't have to text, she didn't have to do Google Translate. And she would even say in Spanish, like, how do you say this in English? In front of the, you know, in front of the class. And because we say, it's okay to ask, because we're also learning from you. Like, how do you say it in Spanish? So now she said, like, how do you say it in English? So when she's facilitating the activity. So that's her. So that's the end product. Um, we, we did this for Mother's Day. So it's a lip balm holder or lipstick holder. Um, and then every single activity, we always asked for their feedback. How did it go, right? Because a lot of times we just do the activity and then bye, scram, you know? No, we asked for their feedback. Was it okay? How I had... Well, because the pandemic gave us all these um, bit mo bitmojis, avatars, right? So I had mine. And like, is it easy? Is it just right? Or is it too hard? So they would say, every single one of them would say what they thought of the activity, like how hard it was or how easy it was. So now we go to the more, <laughs> like, more serious part of the presentation. So we wanted to find out if we could actually measure self-determination. Because as far as we know, in terms of like the OT literature, we don't have anything that is um, that is standardized, that is good for school base. So we found a couple and we just modified it with the help of the um, speech and language pathologist. Like what would be the skills that you're also looking for that's tied up to self-determination? So we did modify what's called the air self-determination scale. So 
Um, so this one we gave to the APE, the teacher, and the SLP. So for Amy. So because we wanted to find out, like, was there really a change? I mean, we saw the change while she was, like, confident, you know, to be in front of the classroom and talk to, to her peers. Um, but we wanted to find out, like, could we actually measure it and be so that it could become a goal, right, in the future. So... These are the things that we were um, looking for. So I'm not going to read through each one. Um, and this is like the sample of the survey question, the survey questions. We'll just outline them there. And then, so these are the responses. So the beginning of the school year, you see how you know, different. So it went up, right? 27 to 51, 28 to 54, 30 to 54. So it was a simple measure for us to see like, you know, are we actually addressing self-determination by the things that we've been doing, like having things in context, collaborating with the other professionals. So just with the simple measure, we saw the progress score or scores. Um, and then a lot of the um, answers, like, from she, so the answers like actually jump from never like she never did it now she's doing it all the time so she knows how to evaluate results results of her actions to determine what was effective and she gathers information on results of her actions and then if she can change that because sometimes like the awareness is there right but do i actually know what i'm supposed to do like if i did not do something according to the directions or if i did not do what was asked of us to do during the group activity do you know do i know what to do next because that's what we're trying to have them develop. Like, can you problem solve? Can you identify what you needed to improve, you know, what you need to improve on, right? And what are we going to do for the next session? And then, um, and all of them, the SLP, AP, and the teacher, they agreed that she became um, confident about using feedback to evaluate the results of her own work, which for a middle schooler is hard, right? So after this this year or this project, she moved on to high school. So that was the perfect timing. Um, so um, I think we only have like a couple minutes left, but we were five minutes. So we're not gonna go to um, like, I, I know, like the sharing of the challenges. Um, so we did a simple Google form for us to know identify like what are you know what do you think are the benefits and challenges of using interprofessional collaboration and um benefits 100 percent engagement 100 percent participation right and then preparing this for inclusion well we only had one student so it was it was hard to gauge at that time when i did the the questionnaire like is she really prepared to do inclusion because it wasn't really up to us right um but she did move on to the district program after this project was done and then everything was 100 percent, which was a good thing right because we were scared that are we doing this for nothing <laughs> so um yeah so our student actually developed you know many ways of expressing herself and she knows her goal she knows what to change with the goal she knows how to make choices so that actually helped her move on or move up to high school in a district program um, and then for the I um, what's that the interprofessional activities like benefits so all all of us who were there we said that we knew more about the roles of the other professionals we actually learned skills on how they're doing things you know for us to achieve the goals the IEP goals together um, and we we became aware of educational standards because you know like APE. Like when, when our coach actually said, oh, there's a standard for that. You want me to put it up there? We actually, no, OTs are not very knowledgeable about all the educational standards. So when he said, do you want me to put it on the slide so, so it's clear? We actually knew about those standards that not even just motor, right? Like they're good standards for us to actually work towards. Um, and then there's better communication among the staff when we were doing the collaborative slides and the collaborative activities. So um, we're going to go skip the benefits, but there are challenges like in any other, well, it's a new undertaking. Usually we do individual activities, individual sessions, right? Like sessions by the OT, sessions by the APE, sessions by the SLP. So a lot of the challenges, uh, challenge is like, how do we actually collaborate? 
because we are just assigned to many school sites. We have so many different assignments, right? And time constraints is one of the, you know, bigger, bigger challenges. And then uh, in terms of like the students, like, with the students like they, they some of them still do not have the capacity to grab onto that like problem solving right like they're probably at the beginning of like um improving their self-determination but everything has to be prompted so it was a learning curve for some of us because the expectation was high right but we cannot set low expectations if we want good you know good things to happen right so but there was also some level of frustration when we did not get to the result that we wanted um, and uh, since it's new, a lot of our classroom staff, they have to get used to it. So paraeducators, I think in the traditional sense, right? Like, okay, you are responsible for this. You are responsible for that, right? And those, the, the change that we brought in was like, uh, okay, what are we doing now? So that was the beginning, but now they're excited about it. But in the beginning, it was like, no, I don't think we're going to, you know, we're going to be able to help our students with that. So it was there was a little bit of pushback, right? Because it's dif different. It's new. It's different. It might be hard, but it's doable. So I had to do some pep talking, you know, for the staff first before the students. Um, so um, so for the students, like some of them remained. Um, well, they actually became more shy. Because some were already dominating that, you know, dominating because they were more verbal, they're more more expressive. So some of them kind of like, oh, I'm not going to talk anymore. Just like any typical middle schooler, I guess, right? Like somebody's more, um, more social, right? Like, okay, I'm just going to listen. And we said that it's okay if you're not ready to, to talk, if you're not ready to share, that's fine. So we just had them do like more of the passive things that we think would lead to, you know, developing their self-determination um and well the coach kind of like gave us a narrative like of the things that are but in a gist he's just saying that it's challenging because everybody has to be committed and you know you have to invest time you have to invest even money because not every single activity that we have you know, can be reimbursed or not even anything could be reimbursed these days, right? Everything has to be tied to something so you could get funded. So what we did was like a teacher would send out emails in, you know, in the beginning of the week or two weeks before. And then if you have anything of this in your pantry or in your storage, bring them to school, right? Or send them to school. So that's what we did. And we thought of activities that could just be easily you know, you could go or ask, ask your neighbor, ask, you know, whoever else might have it. So we tried to do that. Um, so those are like, that's a summary of what, what we have. So there are still, there's still a lot, a lot in terms of like, you know, challenging things. And, and there's a fast turnover of staff anyways, right? Like you cannot really like just say, oh, you're a new SLP. This is what we do. You should be on board. No, I mean I wish, right? Like, so we, I give that uh, orientation at the start of the, you know, the school year. Like, oh, this is what we're doing here. I hope you have time, you know, and you're willing. I mean, I could start out with the slides, and you could observe, you know, be there, and then if you're already comfortable, it's almost as if like we're training everybody every every time we get a new set of people. Um, yeah. So that's just a link if you are actually interested in, you know, the assessments that are available. Some are old, some are not, uh, all of them are not school-based, right? They're more clinical, but there are, a, there's a few things that we could get from, from those assessments. Um, well, I guess that's it. <laughs> that's our project at Sierra Mont Middle School. Time for questions? Uh, I think we do. Do we have time for questions? A little bit? Yes. Um, I believe it was Alana who said this, but I just want to clarify. You mentioned something about like students tend to go to middle school with goals about handwriting. Um, so I guess my question, I work with an, an elementary school. So I guess my question is, when should we stop trying to get the student to focus on handwriting and just kind of switch them over to typing? Because 
are we harming them by trying to force them to have better handwriting when we know that might just be a lifelong struggle and we can just move on to typing? When should we switch over instead of trying to encourage the handwriting? Okay, that was a very good question. And uh, unfortunately, there's not any evidence that would say, you know, this is the up to this point, right? But for us, I think Melissa and I have the same, you know, so first, we are support services, right, for student access to the curriculum. So I go by that. So my question to the teacher is, what activities do you have in the classroom that would require the student to participate with written expression? So my question is, if, I mean, we do evaluate, like, which aspect of handwriting is hard some some things you could easily you know address by just giving them a specific tool for writing right or um doing what do you call that yeah a specific tool like we start with that like a specific tool for writing but then if there are other things that is Im impeding um participation in written expression that would make the student like work much harder than he's supposed to do like get frustrated right yeah, trigger behaviors, but you're still wanting them to participate, we move on to assistive technology. I think that it is, is the, if, if they're able to, because with assistive technology these days, you can scan a worksheet and they can type right on it. And if they are, and kids are very tech savvy, they can text like nobody's business. So if, if it's, if they can express themselves that way without, you know, independently, we always want to try to encourage independence. If if that is what helps them to be independent and ex be able to answer their questions without having to just feel frustrated and like pulled down. I mean, we, a lot of times, it, sometimes parents really want their kids to be able to write their name, but you know, the kid doesn't want to hold the pencil. Like, you know, at some point they can stamp get them a name stamp. They stamp their name. Look at you, put your name on your paper by yourself. You know, like, and sometimes once the pressure is off, they'll start doing it. But if they can, we want to encourage independence and, and the free thinking. So if they can express themselves by typing, you know, but I have some kids that don't have letter recognition. So typing isn't going to help them. So then we need to think of other things, right? So, yeah. So the question is like, what are you wanting the student to do? If you want the student to answer worksheets, right? If you want them to participate, I mean, there's so many ways, right? From from our lockdown, right? You can use videos to to actually, right? To actually say your answer if you can speak, right? Oh, is there another? Oh, I was just gonna add to the uh, um, add to what you're saying, but what baffles me, right, is the adult mindsets of like, no, I there's no reason. I just they need to write. Well, why? Well, because I think it's important. Because right then it goes to their own personal, I you know, ideological or beliefs that are not grounded in research or best practices or right or it makes me also think of like um like when we are dealing with teachers like um having. Um, assistive technology be a universal tool like if there's a student that is struggling there's a lot more students that could benefit from having that but again it's back to like the adult mindsets and the control and the expectation we are the ot's who are supposed to deal with handwriting right and we if you don't get the student writing their full name by the end of the school year we're toast and then my question is like what exactly are you expecting the student to do is it really writing legibly or is it being able to express themselves when you give this prompt or if you have these worksheets can we change them to a digital worksheet because they're very tech savvy and they even know how to use word prediction if they're not re even if they're not reading i'm just saying how many it, like in, oh, yeah, and there's so many, uh, so many different ways for expression. It's not just written. So I would recommend um, exploring those avenues and making sure that your expectation is like, well, if you want your student to actually print legibly, sure, that's a goal. But if you want your student to participate in all the curricular activities that you have, then we could talk about having assistive technology but then for a parent who says i want my kid to write well they're doing that every day 
they have their calendar check-ins, they have their personal information worksheets. They could do that every day, but that's not something that we should be just focusing on because participation using their deficits won't, you know, participation won't happen if we're always, always just having them deal with their deficits. So that's my thing. Like I said, they're already limited, like for students who have OI, right? <laughs> that's their main disability, orthopedic impairment. And then I'm gonna expect them to do well motorically. That's me like saying, you speak Korean and you have to learn Korean by the end of the year. Without me even knowing like, well, do you actually? <laughs> well, first, do you like to learn Korean, right? So that's the same thing. And it's just sad because a lot of our students, don't they, they cannot say, I don't wanna learn it. You know, they could just throw the pencil at you and you think, oh, that's task avoidance. But there's an underlying problem. Like, I don't even know the letter A, B, C, D, E. And then you're asking me to write a name that I don't even know what it is. So we have to think about what is the intention for us to actually want to address this particular skill. And it's sad because we're focusing on skills that are already deficits from day one. So that's not universal. It's not, we're, we're not inclusive. You know, if I cannot ride a bike because I already cannot walk, why test my student or grade my student based on bike riding, right? Or if I cannot hold a pencil because congenitally I have something going on with my joints, and then you want me to hold a pencil using a tripod grasp just because it's normal. Well, we have what we say functional, right? Functional meaning first it's not fatiguing. <laughs> it has the, the results that you would want to see and then they're willing to do it, right? And it's not causing any other, you know, like secondary issues. That's why you have OTs. Because sometimes we could just say that, right? Like here, here's a, you know, pencil grip. Here's a, I don't know, you know, different types of writing utensils. You can find them anywhere now, even on Amazon. But but the thing is, like, is there any other thing that's compounding, you know, like the factors that are preventing the student from actually engaging in the task? So, and, and it's always with us, like, it's always behavior. We're always saying, oh, there's a behavior when it comes to writing. Well, why, why not? I cannot do it because I do not know the letters. <laughs> and you're asking me to, it's like me being asked to copy Chinese characters and then write a five sentence paragraph with Chinese characters. And I'm not Chinese. Even if people say, yeah, I said, no, I'm too brown. <laughs> and then I don't really speak Chinese because I'm not, I'm Filipino. See, that's the thing I'm saying, right? Like we don't even know where they're coming from. Like, why am I resisting? Well, I have a student who's very good at copying, mind you. And then when I did a triennial assessment, I mean, she could copy anything. She didn't know the letters. So what then now, right? Like, okay, we reached that goal. Name name is complete. Everything is done, right? But then is it meaningful? Is it relevant? And then you say their behaviors when you give a worksheet because she doesn't really know what she's writing. I mean, what's the whole point? So there, right? But what's the whole point? So yeah, we, we, we try. We try because we want to make sure that we're addressing the skill deficit because that's what ODs are there for. We still have to address the skill deficits. It's a bad word, you know, just to say address the skill deficit so that becomes positive, right? But sure, sometimes there's a certain, you know, degree wherein we could actually, you know, push them to a higher, you know, printing skill. But with our students who are in the more severe disabilities, the relevance is not there. So again, are we actually providing them the tools that they actually need? Because if not, then in what after three years, you're going to have to think of a different goal because it's not going to get achieved. And we see that over and over and over again. And I know it's hard because there's so many traditional, you know, like ways of thinking, right? Like, oh, but it's basic. Well, because before it was, right? Like you have to print, there's a curriculum, you have to have a penmanship of uh, what, Zayner, Blosser, you know, the, but now they're not even grading it, like in gen ed. So why are you, why are we even expecting our um, students with disabilities to actually write a certain way 
if they can express themselves in a different way. I'm going to ask you how 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 much I mean I know there are some people who still want to you know write like journal and everything but you know the percentage of adults like how much do you actually write with a pen and paper with this type of font right so I'm just saying if you're comparing our students to the norm what is the norm so it has to be their norm. Like, I do not want to write with a paper and pencil at this point. Some of them would until elementary school. And then when they find out that, oh, there's an app for that, right? They participate more. Yeah. During the pandemic, I, not I noticed my own teenage kids, they would be doing like a assignment on on their Google Drive, right? And they're, they're just dictating, they're just talking into their phone. And I was like, you wrote your paper? And then I'd see it, I'd be like, oh my God, like, like, like things that I wouldn't even think of because I'm sitting there trying to type it or on the computer, they were just getting it done on their phone because they would just open their Google Drive for school on their phone. I was like, oh my gosh. So I think a technology, I think that's something I learned during the pandemic, like technology has opened so many more doors to make things accessible. And, you know, as OT for 20 plus years, you know, when we first started in OT, yeah, we were, we, it was all about the tripod handwriting goal. And now it's like, you know, what is, we look at the bigger picture of what we want them to do. Like some kids, they won't form letters, but you know, they're great at like drawing lines. Well, then let's have them draw lines to connect their answers or circle the correct answer. We can work on still writing things to express themselves but rather than just copying 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 like that's not making the connection rather empowering them to make choices is more important or being able to express what they think and yes there's many many different ways to actually have them do what they need to do in the classroom and if we're not grading handwriting or printing or penmanship we called it right it, with the gen ed then we should not be expecting our students with disabilities to actually write better than their same age peers who are just texting are there other apps you suggest like i know one's called like snap type pro are there any other apps that you oh, that's for for worksheets yeah a lot of my students for I support mild mod. Mm -hmm. So it's writing due to spelling difficulties mm -hmm. a lot of ways. Okay. Um that's a lot of the challenges because they're they're very self-conscious about their spelling ability. Mm -hmm. So then they're choosing to not write anything. Mm -hmm. Not that they can't hold the pencil correctly or do any of that. They have that skill. It's just the spelling is holding them back from wanting anything that has word prediction would help. So I know co writer, they have that too. Um Co, C O dash writer. So I think it that has the option to include pictures too. Like if they want to create sentences, you know, if they're more visual instead of just like the words. Yeah. Some yeah, they have clicker, we have co-writer. Um, there's a there's a lot right now. Yeah. Yeah, but but for worksheets, the snap type pro is pretty um intuitive. Even though I they reduced the paperwork. Yeah. Yeah, which is sad because you cannot see the progress anyways. Yeah. Well, thank you for joining us today. We really had fun thinking about what we should be doing in the schools now. <laughs> thank you.